Good morning. I asked the Shabbat Shalom, I asked a couple of guys, I said, where is everybody? They said, well, it rained. <laughs> is that like a southern thing? Or that doesn't, that doesn't happen at football games, does it? People still go in the rain? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You get it, right? Yeah. So uh, I'd like to read you a psalm that's, it's an incredible psalm. It's, um, if I had to say one of my favorites, this would be right up there, if not my favorite. Um, singing, singing this psalm, the people, because they're songs, psalm's a song. It's basically Israel's hymnal. Singing this psalm, the people are celebrating God's law, which is, uh, you know, something you never hear anymore in, in Christian circles, right? Uh, and if you do, it's always a negative connotation, which is... To me, it's like beguiling how, how Satan was able to pull that off. But when they sing this psalm, the people are celebrating God's law, and they're celebrating as his supreme revelation of himself. God and his law are one, guys. If you want to know what God would, was like or is like, look at his laws. That's who he is. It's a revelation of himself. That's why the word took on flesh. It was the law that took on flesh and dwelt with us. It says, um, and, and, and basically, the, the psalm is kind of short, but I, I want you to know there's a lot to it. There's, there's two volumes being spoken here. The first volume shows God as the mighty one, the creator, and it reveals his power. And then the second part of it reveals him as the one who enters into a covenant relationship with us. God is giving us his law just as you would tell a, your child when they're two years old, look both ways when you cross the street. Why are you telling them that? <laughs> because there's this 4,000-pound machine that could kill them if they don't. You're telling them that to, to protect them and prosper them and make sure they maintain peace, right? It's a sad state of affairs when believers don't see that. When believers don't see that God's law is a ways of pleasantness, peace, and protection. If you think of some of your worst times in your life, it's probably when you were being disobedient to those laws, not obedient. So... I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, I don't think people really, I don't think Christians really believe that, but for some reason, I don't know. There's some negative connotation to it that I can't figure out how it, it manifests itself in the body of Messiah. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The dome of the sky speaks the work of his hands. Every day it utters speech. Every night it reveals knowledge. You've probably heard sermon after sermon on YouTube and everywhere else about the glories of the galaxies. You know, that basically, what, what does the naked eye see? How many stars? 5,000. And with a basic little telescope, you see 2 million. And the polymer telescope in San Fran, you see billions of galaxies. Billions of galaxies. So we know this is like astronomical. That's where we get that term from. And so we know that simply by looking up, a man can know there's a God. Just by looking up at the sky. It says, without speech, without a word, without their voices being heard, their line goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. This is called the Sermon of the Stars. In them he places a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from the bridal chamber, with a delight like an athlete to run the race. It rises on one side. Now, we know it doesn't ride. We know the earth spins and the, the sun is in the middle, but it's just, you know, symbolic. It rises one side of the sky, circles around to the other, and nothing escapes its heat. So that's talking about God's amazing power and his knowledge. Now it gets into the word of God, the law of the Lord. It, intro it introduces us to the law of the Lord. It says the Torah or the law, depending on which version you're reading, of Adonai is perfect. <sighs> Where do you go from there? But it, it, the beautiful thing about this is it lists eight excellent qualities, and of course eight is a number for new beginnings, which means every time you obey the Lord, you're, it's like you're new again. It's amazing. It says, the Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring the inner person, restoring the soul, restoring your decision maker, restoring the seat of your emotions. The instruction of Adonai, which is another word for the Torah, is sure, making wise the thoughtless. So it brings restoration, it brings wisdom. 
<laughs> Who can't use that? The precepts, of course, another word for the law of Adonai, are right. Rejoicing the heart makes one happy, brings joy. The mitzvah, again, the commandment of Adonai is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Adonai is clean, enduring forever. The rulings of Adonai are true. They are righteous altogether. More desirable than gold, than much fine gold. What, what the psalmist is saying here is that in order to find its treasures, you got to dig. You can't do a, guys, you can't do a drive-by. I'm, I'm sure there's people in here who haven't read this in a week, maybe a month. I know it's hard to believe. And if that's you, you're probably saying, wow, I don't feel so great about that. Listen to me. I had a pastor call me yesterday and say, you know, I know this guy in, in so-and-so, and he's very dynamic, and he's a good communicator. I almost threw up. He's a friend of mine. I told him, I said, you're going to make me throw up. He said, what do you mean? I said, do you think any time Yeshua spoke, anybody said, he's really a dynamic speaker, and what an effective communicator. Yeshua had the full anointing of God. He received the anointing beyond measure. So when he spoke, all his words were anointed fully by the Holy Spirit. Every time he spoke, it was either kill the messenger or embrace the message. Every single time he spoke, it was either kill the messenger or embrace the message. I don't care where you go. If that is not happening, think about going somewhere else. Unless you want to stay the same. And the sad part about staying the same, my friend, is you can't. God is on the move. So you're either moving towards God or away from God. You can't stay still. There's no moment frozen in time. <sighs> Got to dig. Can't do a drive-by. Can't get a verse in your inbox. You can't, I mean, you can, but that's, it's insanity. It's spiritual insanity. It says the word of God is sweeter than honey or drippings from the honeycomb. Look, I don't know about you, but I love honey. I, I drink honey right out of the bottle. We go through honey in our house like crazy. I love honey. I hate tea, but I have tea just to have honey. <laughs> but the purest honey is that which drips from the comb rather than being pressed out. If you press the honey, it's not as sweet. You got to be patient. You got to be, listen to what the psalmist is saying. This thing is dripping with pure honey, but you got to take your time. You got to dig and be patient with the word of God. Guys, I'm crying out to you. I'm crying out to you in a time when people have no time for the word of God, but they have time for nonsense. Nonsense. And I'm sure you want to get close to God, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You'd be somewhere else where they'll give you a fill in the blanks in 20 minutes, which is nonsense. But if you want to get close to God, why aren't you willing to put in the work? A anything good that you've accomplished takes work. You see these guys, these athletes or these businessmen, what do you think? It was by luck? Morons sit there and watch a professional athlete and go, this guy stinks. He stinks? He's the best in the world. And he didn't get there by a stroke of luck. It was incredible, arduous work. Rabbi, I really want to get close to God. You do? Okay. If you do, there's a way to go about it. You've got to spend time in his presence. It's not just reading the word. Because I'm telling you, I've met my fair share of Christians who know the word of the Lord, but do not know the Lord of the word. You have to spend time in his presence, communing with him to find out who he is. And you know what the beauty of it is? The more time you spend with somebody, the more time they rub off on you. The word anointed is Mashiach in Hebrew. Do you know what the root is? Moshach, which means to rub to spread or to smear. If you want God to rub himself on you, you can't do it from a distance. And you can't do it on the run. you got to stay still with the Lord. 
I love peanut butter and jelly. I make it all the time, but I don't make it running. Because the jelly is going to go everywhere except on the bread. You hear what I'm saying? And if you're good with your relationship with God, then, then be good with it. But this is a terrible place to be if you want to be complacent. This will just piss you off. You'll hate me for the message. You'll feel bad. There's no reason to feel bad. It's a beautiful thing to spend time with God. You just fall in love with Him and that's all you want to do. Through them, through them, through the word, your servant is warned. <gasps> Don't warn anybody today. <gasps> Tell them everything's okay. Do you know how, do you have any idea how unloving it would be for somebody to get a test and it come up positive and the doctor said, just tell them they're fine. The word of God's like a spiritual x-ray. Nobody's fine. But what a beautiful thing to press in into sanctification and to draw closer to God and see God actually changing your heart and your soul. It's a beautiful thing. Look, I don't know. I don't know. Some people want to be great athletes. They want to be great businessmen. They want to be great singers, and there's nothing wrong with that. I want to be like Yeshua. I don't know about you. And then he says, who can discern unintentional sins? These are not premeditated. They're not premeditated. Cleanse me from hidden faults, sins we're not even aware of. He's repenting of sins we're not. There are so many sins that we didn't even realize we did, even this morning. He says, also keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Those are sins born out of pride. Those are the worst ones. The father of all sin is pride. So he got Lucifer kicked out of heaven. He says, then I will be blameless and free of great offense. And then David ends with a prayer, a beautiful prayer. He talks about God being his strength and his security. And he talks about him being his redeemer, how he buys us back from sin and shame. He says, may the words of my mouth, once he gets through this, he's, he's amazed at God's power. He's amazed at God's intimate covenant relationship. He talks about how the word of God is just overwhelmingly beautiful and pure and perfect, brings on wisdom. Then he repents, which is always good. And then once he's all cleaned up and he's ready to go, he goes, may the words of my mouth, may what I say and the thoughts of my heart, because it's thoughts, words, and action, may they be acceptable. The word in Hebrew is rotson, and it means may they bring you pleasure, Father. Wow, so beautiful. Oh my goodness. David's saying, may they bring you delight. May the words of my mouth and the thought of my heart be acceptable in your presence, I don't know my rock. I don't know my redeemer. Hallelujah a million times over. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we just um, come before you like we always do on your holy Shabbat, a day that you set aside for our benefit. I don't believe for a minute that the Jews kept Shabbat. I believe that Shabbat kept the Jews. I believe that you gave it to us as a heritage, as a delight. And what a blessing it is that Gentiles can be grafted in and enjoy your holy Shabbat. What a blessing. What a blessing to the world that you would just stop what you're doing and give us your undivided attention for a day. And then we can go on a pleasure cruise with our Heavenly Father. What a blessing. What a sick, demonic thing it is to think that it's legalistic. What a sad state of affairs. Religion, how it just buries us and it kills intimacy. Father, I'm, I'm going to have a good day with you. I'm determined to have a good day with you. I'm determined to hang out with my dad. I don't need to go to the park. I don't need to go to the movies with you. I just need to be with you. Just be, you don't even have to say anything. Just be here. Just, just sensing your presence is enough for more. I love you, and I know that I'm in good company. I know this congregation loves you, Father God. I know those people watching, some of these people in Kalamazoo, and they have no fellowship. They have no friends who get it. Everybody thinks they're whacked and weird and they're in some kind of cult. 
because they don't worship on Sunday. So sad for them. And this is all they got. This is their lifeline. So I'm asking you to send out a tremendous blessing from this place, Father, today to them. I'm asking you to bless their very socks off. I'm asking you to bring them joy personified. And I ask all this in the name above all names, the name at which every knee, and I mean every knee, will bow. It's in Yeshua's name I pray. Amen and amen. Guys, Shabbat Shalom.